So let's open with prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for your word tonight. Lord, we love, you know, the worship time, and we love the precious Holy Spirit and the anointing and all of that, Lord, but we also, we love your word. And Lord, we just take a moment to thank you so much for the word of the Lord. Where would we be without the word? And Lord, as we get into this word tonight, I ask you to speak through me under the anointing everything that needs to be said tonight. Lord, as Jesus taught us the parable of the seed, the seed and the sower, let your word go out as living seeds sown into good soil. Let your Holy Spirit even now move upon every one of us that are going to be listening to this and, and just help us to have good soil, that we'll be locked in and focused, that we're not going to be distracted by anything, but our minds will just be focused on what, what you're saying to us, Lord, and that our hearts and minds are good soil. The word will go out as living seeds into that soil, watered by the Holy Spirit, and take root, grow produce a hundredfold harvest of eternal fruit that remains until Jesus comes. Lord, let this be a powerful, effective time in the Word. Let there be a washing of the water of the Word. Let your light of your truth shine and dispel the darkness and lies and deception of the enemy and bring truth and revelation. And we know Jesus said the birds of the air try to steal the seed. So, Lord, we submit this Word unto you, and we bind up in Jesus' name anything that would try to hinder or distract or steal this seed from any person, any hindrance, we commit to be bound in Jesus' name and back off right now. Lord, let your angels clear that out and let the winds of your Holy Spirit carry this out among the nations. It's going to get where it's supposed to and accomplish what it's supposed to do. And we stand on the promise, Lord, that your word will not return void. It will go forth and accomplish that which you sent it forth to do. So, Lord, we thank you for it and we bless you and we expect it tonight that everything will be accomplished in and through this time in every life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right, so we're going to get in this tonight. If you could bring my lapel up just a tiny bit so I don't have to yell too much. All right, so we're on part seven. We've been going through the book of Revelation, and we got to Revelation chapter four where it says, come up here. And so it's talking about the rapture. And so as we get into this tonight, um, I've had to take a few sermons to deal with the rapture because it's a controversial issue. It's, a, it's something a lot of people don't understand. And so I'm taking, you know, three or four sermons to explain it all. And so tonight I'm going to be dealing with more of the Greek words and the Greek perspective. And next week I'll deal more with the Hebraic expression, understanding the rapture from that point of view. So as we're going to go through the notes here tonight, if you don't have notes, I, I apologize. Um, there is some online, but if not, you'll still get a lot out of this tonight. So just give me your best ear. So I'm dealing with part seven called harpazo. And harpazo is the Greek word for where we get the word rapture from. And so, you know, some people say, well, the word rapture isn't in the Bible. Well, actually, it kind of is. The word harpazo is the word that's used, and rapture is not a bad translation of that word at all. So somebody was asking someone that was fluent in Greek was or they were somebody that was not fluent was asking someone that is fluent in Greek. OK, let's get this clear. <laughs> anyway, he was asking them, how would you describe the word herpazo? And he said, well, he said, let's say that you were walking down the street or on the sidewalk. And your child had kind of wandered a little bit into the street and there was a car coming and you reached out and grabbed your child and kind of snatched them out of the way of danger, he said that is the best way to describe the word harpazo. <coughs> so this word is translated in English as like a catching away, a snatching away, or you could say rapture, but it's, it's something where you're being snatched from danger. It's a suddenly, it's a quick thing. And that's what we're looking at tonight, the harpazo of the Lord, okay? So here's something that's interesting as I go through this. Uh, I thought this was interesting. I'm just going to share this. So, you know, sometimes the spiritual resistance, the spiritual warfare against something is interesting. 
So there was a group of Christians that had went to a particular meeting. Let me just kind of read you the notes here of what they described it. There's an individual named Benjamin Krim who is a, he practices the occult and he's, you know, one of these new age type people. And he supposedly channels this being that he calls Lord Maitreya. Now you and I would call Lord Maitreya a demon, okay? But to people that are in New Age and the occult or whatever, they view this being as being some kind of a wise one or an ascended master or whatever. And so there was a group of Christians that went to Northern California to a very wealthy Episcopalian church where they had had this individual named Benjamin Krim come in and speak. Now why in the world would a Christian church have somebody like that? That's a good question. And there were about 400 people present. That's disconcerting right there. But Benjamin Krim was up there and he was talking. And at some point he's supposed to channel this being. Most people that were in the audience were into the new age. And so the difference between new age type of meditation and then what God teaches us to meditate on his word is, is extremely different. Let me explain that for a moment. When God tells us meditate on my word day and night, he's talking about your mind is very active and disciplined, isn't he? Disciplining the mind, focusing. You know, just like you would churn uh, cream and turn it into butter, there's a churning. As you meditate on the word of God, your mind is very active and disciplined and it's churning the word in you. And it's, you know, it's a powerful thing. But anyway, the almost the exact opposite of that would be like the new age and the occult and what they teach is through meditation that your mind goes completely blank and passive that's very dangerous and so most of the people that were in this meeting were allowing themselves to go into like a trance and be controlled by this lord Maitreya but the christians were not affected and some of the christians that were there were there because they were concerned about this but they said this I thought this was really interesting they said that when this Lord Maitreya appeared through this guy manifest and began to speak through him that this weird being which is a demonic spirit spent 30 minutes of his speech ridiculing the rapture does anybody else find that interesting that the devil would think it's important enough of a subject to ridicule it for 30 minutes think about that sometimes just the fact that the enemy is willing to spend so much time targeting something is a very good sign so I'm gonna talk about that tonight one of the individuals I love his teaching so much is dr. Cho out of South Korea he has some of the best teachings that I've ever read or studied on prayer and he did an incredible teaching on Revelation and Daniel anyway he's made this statement in a book he wrote called the apocalyptic prophecy and he said this he said regrettably even though the Bible makes it very clear like a clear distinction between the two comings of Christ he said some people are still mistaken in interpreting what will happen and when they teach that the church will also go through the tribulation, they not only hurt themselves, but they also lead others astray. And I know that's not their intention, but that is the way that it is. And it, there's great teachers like Derek Prince and others that see the rapture very clearly in the scriptures. So I'm coming from that angle tonight. So what exactly is the rapture? it's interesting because the early church in Paul's day the early church was living with an expectation that Jesus could come anytime so keep that in mind and I'm a product of the Brownsville revival and, and I remember just Steve Hill talking about things all the time and I remember our brother Steve would say stuff like this he'd say you know this thing can go on and on and on but we better live like he's coming tomorrow he's right see the early church was living that way they were living a life expecting the Lord to come any moment of course he didn't come in that generation it wasn't the right time and so Paul had to write to 
the Thessalonians because they were concerned because some of the church members were dying. And they were saying, well, Paul, you know, what's going to happen? We're waiting for the Lord to come. There's people dying. They didn't understand what to do. And so Paul began to write to them about this concern. But before I get into that, what exactly is the rapture? You know, people need to think about this for a moment. See, it talks about when Jesus comes. It talks about life from the dead. And when he comes to Israel and all of Israel is saved, it, it talks about like life from the dead. And the Bible refers to Jesus as the first fruits of our resurrection. What people have got to understand is this. All those over the last couple thousand years that have died in Christ, their spirit and soul is with the Lord, but their bodies are still in the grave. When the rapture takes place, what is actually happening is this, that we're being given our glorified bodies. It's literally the resurrection of the dead. Isn't that awesome? See, right now, when somebody dies in Christ, they go to be with the Lord, and that's their spirit and soul, but their body's still down there. When the Lord comes in that way as the rapture, the Bible says the dead in Christ will rise. And those that are alive and remain that are ready will be changed in the blink of an eye. What's happening is it's literally the resurrection of the dead. So it's that first resurrection. So I'm going to read a few scriptures tonight because some people have never heard this taught before and so we need to deal with that. Now, I'm, I'm concerned because I've, there's certain Bible teachers through the years that have been such a great, great blessing to me. And I think that many of you probably share this concern, but I'm personally concerned because a lot of our generals of the faith are going home to be with the Lord. A lot of those that, that were such powerful teachers of the Word of God are going home to be with the Lord or different things are happening because of their age. They're not really active in ministry. And I'm concerned because there's a generation that's coming up that doesn't really study the Bible like the previous generation. And so there's a lot of people. I get a lot of response. There's a lot of people out there that are starving for the word and they're just not getting it. And there's a lot of people out there that are hungry for end time prophecy to be taught, but that it's not taught very often. And we're living in a time in these latter days where the coming of the Lord is near, the signs are clear. And this is a time that we need to be teaching on end time prophecy, probably like no other time because we're literally going into it. And so 1 Thessalonians 4, sorry, verse 13, Paul had to deal with this issue. So if you're following along, 1 Thessalonians 4, sorry, in verse 13, Paul said, I do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, talking about those who have died, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope, talking about the heathen that die in their sin. He said in verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, see, Jesus is the first fruits of our resurrection, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Now look at this description. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of god that's the shofar and the dead in christ will rise it's a resurrection then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the lord in the air where in the air this is important because I'm going somewhere with this tonight. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So at the coming of the Lord in this instance here, there's three sounds. There's a shout. Then there's a voice of an archangel. Then there's a blast of a shofar. And then it's described as the dead in Christ will be raised up out of the grave and it's as they're going to be given their glorified bodies and those of us that are alive will be turned our bodies will be changed to glorified bodies and together we're going to go with the lord we're going to meet him in the air now it's important remember that phrase because there's two comings of the lord 
One of them is in the air, and I'll explain the other one later. But we're going to meet him in the air. And I want you to think about something for a moment. If you and I were to die right now, your body is going to remain in that grave, but your, your spirit and soul is going to be with the Lord. But after the rapture, you and I that are in Christ are going to be with him with our glorified bodies. And so 1 Thessalonians 1.9 it says this. This is 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 9. So up until this point, I've been talking about the book of Revelation. We went through the seven churches. We went through Revelation 1. Then we went through the seven churches. And then we got into chapter 4. And chapter 4 says, come up here. And you don't read about the church on the earth the entire rest of Revelation. And it's interesting as we studied the seven churches of Asia that Ephesus represents the early church and they lost the revival. They lost the move of God. It moved into the dark ages. But remember, Philadelphia was the church that was, saw the restoration of that. The restoration of power again. It's like a revival church. A missions-minded church. And what did the promise of God, what was it to the church in Philadelphia? That they would not have to go through what was coming on the earth. They would be taken out. And when we got into Revelation 4, come up here, and then we saw this revelation of heaven. And so that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with this catching away, this harpazo. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, it says, For they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you, and how you turned to God from idols to serving the living and true God. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Now notice that. Again, the reference to the resurrection, okay? That is Jesus, look at this, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Now everybody, I, I want everybody to really pay attention to some of these phrases because it's very important to establish some doctrine here. We are rescued from the wrath to come. How many knows there's a difference between being persecuted for your faith and the wrath of Almighty God? Those are two completely different things. We are not promised to be rescued from persecution. In fact, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. <laughs> He's promised us that we're going to have some trouble in this world if we're true Christians. He said, you know what? If they hated me, they're going to hate you too. There's going to be persecution. But it's a big difference being persecuted and living under persecution as opposed to the wrath of God coming on the earth. Which is what will happen during the, what we call the seven year tribulation. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9, it says, For God has not destined us for wrath. Now, obviously, that, I believe that's referring to the tribulation time, but it also refers to going to hell and the wrath of God, okay? We're the true people of God, the true elect, those that are born of God, those that have been bought by the blood of Jesus, God's true people, we are not destined for wrath. But he said, for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are doing. Isn't that awesome? And then in Revelation, now remember that Revelation, not everything in Revelation is chronological in order, okay? But in Revelation 16, 15, there's a reference here. So in one instance, Jesus is going to come like a thief in the night. It's going to be a suddenly, like a blink of an eye. He said, you will not know that exact moment. It'll just happen. It's a quick thing, like a thief in the night. But then there's this other coming of the Lord where all eyes will see him. And so I'm going to explain these two comings here in just a moment. But in Revelation 16, 15, he references that first coming. He says, it's behold, I'm coming like a thief. 
Blessed is the one who stays awake. Now remember that staying awake. Remember that sleeping has to do with prayerlessness in the Bible. So staying awake has to do with being a watchman, being a prayerful person. So he said, blessed is the one who stays awake and also keeps his clothes unstained. How many knows the Lord is not coming for a filthy, dirty bride that's all caught up with the world? That's not who he's coming for. He's coming for a bride without spot or blemish. And then it says, so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. So there's something about staying awake and keeping yourself pure that has to do with him coming like a thief. Did everybody catch that? Now, I already taught on the Jewish weddings of times past, so keep that in mind as we go through it because that has a lot to do with this thief in the night. In Luke 21, 36, Jesus said this, be always on your watch. Now, remember, what is being a watchman? A prayer warrior. Not sleeping, being prayerless, but being somebody that's a prayer warrior. Now listen, we see the times that we're living, don't we? I think that most people that are truly God's people, not everybody that goes to church is really saved. I understand that. But God has his remnant. And those that are truly God's people that have the Holy Spirit living in them, they know that something is up right now. They see the signs in the earth. They sense it. They know that the coming of the Lord is drawing near. And because we see that, this is a time that we need to make sure that we're purifying ourselves from anything that's unclean. We also need to make sure that we're keeping our watch, that we're being a prayerful people. And Jesus said this, so be on your watch and pray. Look at this, that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen now remember that word escape there that Jesus Christ said this didn't even come from Paul or John or Peter this came from the mouth of Jesus himself he said pray that you may be able to escape what's coming upon the earth what's about to happen and that you'll be able to stand before the Son of Man See, one of the things that has been kind of a ridicule against those that believe in the rapture is like they say an escape mentality. And I think it's kind of a way just to kind of take a dig, kind of mock, you know, those that believe in the rapture. But the thing is that Jesus Christ himself said to pray that you escape these things. So they're not really mocking people that believe this as much as they think they are making fun of Christians, other Christians. They're actually mocking what Jesus said himself. So let's just be real. So that's one of the um, attacks against those that believe in the rapture, that they have some kind of escape mentality. But here's the thing. I believe that I'm here to occupy till I come. I'm not going to go off somewhere like a hermit and buy a cabin out in the middle of nowhere <laughs> hoard a bunch of food and hide out somewhere and wait for the coming of the Lord okay I'm here I'm not afraid I'm here to be winning souls and seeing revival and seeing people's lives change and as long as I'm here breathing that's what I'm gonna be doing I'm not trying to escape persecution I'm here to do what God's called me to do but there comes a point in time when this dispensation, which I'm about to explain, is going to be over, the shift is going to happen. You move into the tribulation time, and that's when the remnant bride is supposed to be with the Lord at the marriage supper of the Lamb. So we have this, there's two different comings of the Lord. So let's talk about the first one. Well, let's talk about the one that's the, um, all eyes will see him after the tribulation time so after the seven years jesus is going to come and i'm going to give you some descriptive terms here in the bible but if i was to describe to you a day and i said okay on this day 
it was like 90 degrees it was hot out the sun was shining it was really humid and I was to give you all these descriptive terms about that day and then I was to come later and I was talking about a day and I said but that day it was kind of chilly the wind was blowing out of the north it was overcast it was drizzly would I be talking about the same day or am I obviously talking about two different days here okay just keep that in mind because there's no way this is the same day so after Paul had his encounter with God here he is riding on his donkey down the road to Damascus and Jesus appears to him he's knocked off his donkey on the ground blinded he's led by the hand to straight street he gets prayer these scales fall off his eyes he was blind scales come off he can see he's baptized in the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues he had a radical encounter with Jesus we need a lot of those encounters but in today's modern church if, if Paul was here telling his encounter they'd run him off as some lunatic <laughs> anyway and so we need some encounters with the Lord but Paul had this life-changing encounter after this happened to him for all these years he was a Pharisee he thought he knew everything and everything he had believed up to that point about Jesus was just flat wrong and so now he decides I don't need to confer with man I need to go alone and be with God in Galatians he talks about that and so he went out to Arabia for years and possibly went to Mount Sinai where Moses had had that powerful encounter the children of Israel God came down and maybe where he went but he spent years seeking God and God gave the Apostle Paul divine revelation he documented this revelation and I'm gonna show you by the end of this how when Israel came to Sinai it was a picture and type of the rapture so one event that I'm about to describe where all I see him when he comes one event is seen by the entire world think about that one event after the tribulation when Jesus comes it's not a meeting in the air his feet touch the Mount of Olives and that's significant because the Mount of Olives splits in two it's not a meeting in the air and the Bible describes it that all eyes will see him look at this I'm gonna read different descriptive terms about this coming at the end of the tribulation here's how it's described Revelation 1 7 behold he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him everybody say every eye this is not a thief in the night where you have to watch him pray because you could miss it you see here it's like describing one day being hot and sunny and another day being cold and drizzly. This is two different descriptions here. In this coming of the Lord, every eye will see him. It says, even those who pierced him, talking about the Jews in Israel, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, so it is to be. In Matthew 24, 27, Jesus describes it and says, for just as lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west so will the coming of the Son of Man be this isn't a thief in the night here this is like a bright explosion of light shining all over Luke 24 or 17 24 for just as lightning when it flashes out of one part and shines to the other so will it be when the son of man uh, when he comes in that day here's another description good descriptive term in acts 1 9 you remember how Jesus Peter asked him well when are these things gonna happen and he said it's not for you to know and then in acts 1 8 kind of the famous chapter we all know he said but you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem Judea to the ends of the earth as you're clothed with power you know well look at this in acts 1 9 after Jesus said these things he was lifted up while they were looking on so wouldn't it be something here you are let's just put ourselves there that day we're right outside Jerusalem we're on the Mount of Olives Jesus is standing on the Mount of Olives and he's sitting here talking to us 
He's giving his final words. And Peter's saying, hey, so when's everything going to happen? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know. But he said, you, you need to go wait in Jerusalem to your clothe with power. Then you're going to be my witnesses. And all of a sudden, while he's talking, he leaves them with that. Make sure you go to Jerusalem. You're going to be clothed with power. Then you're going to be my witnesses. He talks to him. He explains that. Next news you know, Jesus is floating up in the air. Off the Mount of Olives, he's floating up. And I'm going to read it. He was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. He goes all the way up to where a cloud covers him. And as they were gazing intently into the sky, just like me and you would be, <laughs> two men in white clothing stood beside them these are obviously angels in verse 11 it says they said to everybody there men of Galilee why do you stand looking into the sky this Jesus who has been taken up into heaven will come in just the same way as you watched him go into heaven then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives and it was just a Sabbath day journey, which always means a short journey. So Jesus was taken up, and the angel said he will come. Remember, Jesus' ministry last week, I talked about this, was to the house of Israel. The message was to Israel. Remember that? And, and the whole thing, we went through the book of Daniel. So they're speaking there. This is the descriptive term of when Jesus comes back to Israel. Where's Jesus' feet going to land when he comes back to the nation of Israel after the tribulation time on the Mount of Olives? The angel said it. Just as he left, in the same way he's going to come down and his feet are going to stand on the Mount of Olives. In Zechariah 14 verse 4, it describes that. Zechariah 14 verse 4. It says, In that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will split in its middle from east to west, a very large valley, so that half of the mountain will move toward the north, the other half toward the south. That's going to be at the coming of the Lord to Israel. Isn't that something? And he's going to walk into Jerusalem. He's going to sit on the throne of his father David to fulfill the prophecy Gabriel gave Mary. And he's going to reign in Jerusalem over Israel and the nations of the earth for a thousand years. But that's at the end of the tribulation. And I'll give you a few more scriptures about that. Last week we talked a lot about Daniel. Went through all of that, the 70 weeks of Daniel. We went through the statue and all that. Okay, Daniel 2.34 you guys remember the statue, head of gold, all the way down to the ten toes, right? So listen to what Daniel says. You continue looking, so there's this statue. And it got all the way down to the ten toes, which are the last day, the end time Roman, revived, revived Rome, rather, with the ten horns and all that, those ten toes. And it says, you continue looking at this statue until a stone was cut out without hands. Now, who in the Bible is described as the stone the builders rejected? Christ. He says, you were looking at this statue, and then there was a stone that was cut out of a mountain without hands, and it came down like a meteor, and it said it struck the statue. Where did it hit the statue? Not in the kneecaps. It hit the statue in the toes, which is talking about the end times. Remember, Babylon, Medes, and Persians, Greece, Rome, down to the end time Rome. So the ten kingdoms. So it comes down and it strikes the end days. It hits those toes. And then it says in verse 35, Then the iron and the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold, were crushed all at the same time and became like the chaff from the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried it away so that not a trace of it was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Isn't that awesome? Remember, mountains speak of governments. What it's saying here is that Jesus, it's like being cut out of the mountain and he's being thrown to the earth like a meteor and he hits the world's kingdoms. They crumble before him 
and then his reign is going to grow and expand until it covers the entire earth y'all are quiet tonight but that's an exciting scripture Revelation 19 11 talks about this same thing he said I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called faithful and true who is this this is Jesus with justice he judges and makes war his eyes are like a blazing fire on his head are many crowns and he has a name written on him no one knows but himself he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God and the armies of heaven follow him riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen white and clean coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations coming out of his mouth a sharp sword to strike down the nations does that sound like Daniel right there and he will rule them with an iron scepter he treads the winepress of the fury and the wrath of God Almighty isn't that something so when Jesus comes, the Bible is clear that the kingdoms of this earth will become the kingdoms of our Lord in Christ. In Revelation eleven fifteen, the seventh angel. So during the tribulation time, there's going to be seven trumpets and seven bold judgments. And when it got to that seventh trumpet, see the, without making it too complicated, the seventh seal would set in motion the trumpets. Then the seven trumpets that seventh one set in motion the bowls okay and so when it got to that last trumpet there the seventh angel that sounded it said with a loud voice in heaven he said the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our lord in christ and he will reign forever and ever so he's he's setting in motion those bold judgments and there's a declaration there because the bold judgments are the last thing to happen before he comes and there's this declaration this angel makes saying it's at hand it's near that the coming of the Lord the Messiah will come and his reign will be forever and ever so do you see this descriptive term here about when Jesus comes at the end of the tribulation time all eyes are gonna see him his feet are gonna land on the ground it's not gonna be a thief in the night or in any way some secret thing when the Bible says all eyes see him, all the nations are aware of this activity. It's not as suddenly. He's there to take over. This is at the end. See, this is what I've been describing all along. There's different prophecies for Israel as opposed to the church. Two completely different things. And this is where most people misinterpret the word of God because they don't know the difference between the two. Jesus' second coming that I'm describing here is to the nation of Israel. Prophesied throughout the Old Testament, prophesied in different places in the New Testament. He's coming to Israel to reign out of Jerusalem on the throne of David. And when he comes, he's going to send his angels. They're going to gather the elect, which has to do with the remaining Jews, which I've already talked about, and any remaining Christians. They're going to be gathered to him. And the Bible says about Israel at that time, it's at the end of the tribulation, Jesus is physically there in Jerusalem, that all those, they're going to look on him whom they've pierced. They're going to mourn, and they're going to accept him as the Messiah because there he is standing there. And what Paul predicted in Romans then all of Israel shall be saved in a day. Isn't that something? So that's at the very end. So that's the prophecies regarding Israel. But here's the prophecies regarding the church. Two completely different things. How many knows that when you're dealing with Israel, you're dealing with a secular nation? You're dealing with a group of people that the overwhelming majority of them do not know Jesus. Especially in the leadership, they reject him as the Messiah. The promises for Israel are there. They're true. They will happen. Nothing can stop that. But it's not the same thing as the promises to the church. They're different. You're dealing with two different people groups. Everybody can see that. So when we're dealing now with the church, I'm going to talk about the catching away, the harpazo. See, Israel is not going to be caught away and meet him in the air and go somewhere. Where I am, there you will be. That's not going to happen. When Jesus comes to Israel, he's coming to Israel to reign over people on the earth. So when Jesus ascended 
after he rose from the dead there was two different ascensions that are very clear in the bible remember how the ladies found him he was like a gardener they thought he was a gardener they didn't recognize him at first and then when they did recognize him he said wait don't touch me because i haven't ascended yet you guys remember reading that so there was some kind of a secret ascension that Jesus did after he raised that we don't know a lot about because the Bible doesn't say much about it, but we know it happened. I suspect that Jesus went in like a great high priest into the tabernacle of heaven and he dealt with something there. Maybe it went back to the original rebellion with Lucifer or something like that, but he dealt with something with his own blood there. Okay. Then he came back. He's on the earth. And the women had come and they had talked to the disciples and said, we saw Jesus raised from the dead. And they believed Peter and John and them ran to the tomb and they believed, but he was gone, right? Thomas was the one that didn't believe, he doubted. But then Jesus appears to them walking through a wall, which would freak anybody out, amen, walks through the wall. He, he has to say, peace be unto you, because I'm sure they were all hysterical. Somebody just walked through the wall, right? And here he is. And he, what does he say to him? Touch me. Put your finger in my hand. Put your finger in my side. And he appeared to them. So he had already ascended and descended once. And it was some secret thing that we don't know a lot about. And then we know about the second time he ascended. Because it was on the Mount of Olives. And we just read about it. So there was two ascensions. In the same way there's going to be two descensions. So this is the one that's before the tribulation time. And again, I don't have time to get back into this, but you remember reading about what is, okay, I described what is the rapture? Well, it's the resurrection of the dead. It has to happen because we have to be given our glorified bodies. So what exactly is what we call the tribulation time? What is it? If the bride is not appointed to wrath, and we know that we're not, what is God dealing with? What is the point of this seven-year period? Well, you have to understand that in Jeremiah, I believe it's chapter 30, it describes this, and the Bible calls it this, the days of Jacob's trouble. So what was Jacob's name changed to? Israel. So it's the days of Israel's trouble. And I talked about it last week. You guys know the 69 weeks of Daniel up into the Messiah. There's still that last week. That seven year period. And when you deal with that, it's not the days of the bride of Christ's trouble. It's the days of Israel's trouble. A stubborn nation that has rejected the Messiah. Jesus said, you did not receive me when I came in my name, but you will receive another when he comes in his. So he's prophesying that there's going to be a false Messiah come. Israel will sign a peace treaty with him for seven years. And when they do that, it's going to set in motion a seven year, that 70th week of Daniel, the days of Jacob's trouble. So that's what the tribulation's about. That it's the days of Jacob's trouble where God is going to deal, his wrath is going to come upon the earth. He's going to deal with Israel. There's a lot to that. I don't have time to get into it. But that's the focus. It's not on some kind of thing about the bride. It's about the nation of Israel. Okay, it's different. So now we're going to dealing with the bride of Christ. So Luke 12, 32. Jesus says, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father is chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourselves money belts that do not wear out an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near nor moth destroy. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And let me just say this. Don't get too caught up with the things of this world. We're just passing through. Have an eternal mindset. While we're here, we could be gone tomorrow. But while we're here, our focus is do what God's called us to do. Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Be dressed in readiness. 
You guys remember I talked about the ancient Jewish weddings. She would wear a veil and she would keep that lamp and the extra oil, remember? He said, look at this, be dressed in readiness. As she was waiting for the bridegroom, she had to be ready for him to come at any time like a thief in the night. She had to be dressed in readiness. And he said, and keep your lamps lit. The only way that young virgin kept her lamp lit is if she had extra oil. You guys remember. He said, be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns for the wedding feast or from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are, are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. See, there's all these warnings Jesus keeps giving us. Be awake, be alert, be sober, be dressed in readiness, meaning don't have your garments soiled. Have your lamp lit that has to do with having a prayer life. Have extra oil, be ready. I'm coming like a thief. You won't know the de exact day or moment. I'm coming. Be ready. All these warnings. Truly I say to you that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and will come up and wait on them. Isn't that something? Whether he comes in the second or even the third watch and finds, that, finds them so blessed are those slaves. And let's just get this straight I've already talked about the ancient Jewish wedding and how he'd go away and come back and steal her in the night so I can't go back over that but anyway this young virgin girl had to make herself ready Jesus is saying here that when he's going to prepare a place for us that has to do with the wedding feast when he comes like a thief in the night to snatch away his bride a meeting in the air we're going to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb, the wedding feast. That's where we're supposed to be. And look at what Jesus says, because this sounds like the final Passover, doesn't it? He says, when I come, he said, I will gird myself to serve. You remember how he wrapped a, something around his waist and he washed the feet of those that were there? Isn't this something? This is a very humbling scripture. He says, I'm going to come and I'm going to snatch away my bride. I'm going to take you to the place I prepared for you, this wedding feast. And he said, I'm going to gird myself to serve and have them recline at my table and I will wait on them. Wow. So whether he comes in the second watch or even the third watch, late into the night, he finds them so blessed are those slaves. In verse 39, but, he sh but be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed the house to be broken into. You too, be ready. You do not know. The son of man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And Peter said, Lord, are you addressing this parable to, parable to us or to everyone else? And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise steward? who my master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations, their food at the proper time. And I said this a few weeks ago. Pastors and leaders, you better be feeding the people the food at the proper time and quit speaking a bunch of motivational speeches. Verse 43, blessed is the slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, I will put him in charge of all my possessions. But if that slave says in his heart, my master is a long time coming and begins to beat the other slaves, both men and women, and to eat and to get drunk, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him and an hour he does not know, and he will cut him into pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers, which is hell. And I read that scripture a few weeks ago and just simply pointed out, I don't know what cut to pieces means, but I don't want to find out. So the proper Jewish reckoning regarding the three night watches, the first or the beginning of the watch in Lamentations 2.19, there was this early watch and then there was the middle watch in Judges 7.19 and the morning watch. The first lasted from sunset to around 10, the second from 10 to around 2 a.m. 
and it lasts from 2 a.m. to sunrise. So it's like this third watch. And obviously it was appointed for the Messiah to come like at the third watch, the last. Because here's how I see it. From Adam's fall to Abraham was about 2,000 years. From Abraham's call, where God cut covenant with him, to Jesus was 2,000 years. And from Jesus' ascension till now has almost been 2,000 years. This is the third watch. Do you see? It's appointed that the Son of Man come at that third watch. Jerusalem has been in service for about 3,000 years. One, two, three. And we know the third day speaks of resurrection. Even Hosea 6, 2. On the third day I will revive them. So there's a lot of these things that point to that third watch. And just like the stone that struck the statue at the ten toes, it didn't come. Jesus didn't come. It wasn't the appointed time during the days of Nebuchadnezzar or in the days of Persia. It wasn't the time during the Grecian Empire. It wasn't even the time during Rome. But in these latter days, it's appointed that the Lord will come at that third watch. So the question is, when is Jesus coming? Is it pre, mid, or post-trib and dealing with the tribulation time? Well, the problem is, again, as I said earlier, that the whole problem here is that the church does not have to do with the tribulation time. That's the problem. People want to do away with the promises to Israel and understanding the prophecies regarding Israel. If you understand the prophecies regarding the nation of Israel versus the prophecies regarding the church, all of end time prophecy seems to fall into place. God isn't dealing with the church during this time. He's dealing with the nation of Israel. So the question is, in regards to the tribulation, is the Lord upset in bringing wrath on his bride? Does that sound right? No. Or is it, as the Bible seems to paint, is it the days of Jacob's trouble? Where God brings his judgment on the nations of the world in regards to Israel, and Israel goes through a very difficult time, and it breaks things down. It, it deals with things to where Jesus said, you won't see me again. He's talking about Israel. Until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That Israel gets down to a place after the Antichrist. I've talked about this where you guys know what I'm talking about. The abomination that causes desolation. He sets himself up in the temple. And two-thirds of the Jews are killed. And it's an oppressive thing. He comes in like another holocaust. And Israel's beat down to a place where they cry out, for salvation to come and when Jesus comes they will surely say blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord it's interesting in regards to the church now I'm gonna deal with a few more things in regards to the rapture the remnant bride so here we are people that have been born of God those that truly are born of God you understand I'm not talking about being religious you can go to church your whole life and still go to hell when you die. I'm not talking about being religious. I'm talking about truly being born of, uh, born of God. You're born again. You're washed in the blood. Your sins are forgiven. You're in a covenant with God. Those that really know him, that have repented, they walk with him. The Lord's going to come like a thief in the night, but yet those people will be ready when he comes. They're looking. And there'll be a quick snatching. They'll be, we'll be given our glorified bodies. If you died before that time, you're still, your body's going to be given to you, raised up. We're going to be given our glorified bodies. It'll be a suddenly, he comes like the blink of an eye. His remnant bride is gone. He said, I go to prepare a place for you that's talking about the wedding feast. And we go there to be with him. The earth is going to go through the most difficult days. Jesus said about those days, it's going to be so bad that if they weren't cut short, no flesh would survive. It's the wrath of God on the earth. But we're going to be the true bride of Christ, the true remnant, are going to be with the Lord at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And at the end of that time, that's his first coming. We meet him in the air. It's a suddenly, it's a secret thing, although once the rapture happens, the whole earth is going to know. I mean, <laughs> millions of people disappear. So in that respect, it's not going to be some big secret. But 
his coming will be quick. It'll be a thief in the night, gone, like the blink of an eye. We're going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But at the end of that tribulation time, the days of Jacob's trouble, Israel has gotten to a place of desperation. They're crying out for God to send salvation. The earth has experienced the wrath of God. All things have been reckoned. The prophecies have been fulfilled. Jesus is going to come in all of us with him, clothed in pure white. And he's going to be coming from the eastern sky. And at that time, we're going to be behind him. We're going to be with him. And there's going to be such a glory about him, a shining, a brightness, that the Bible says that all eyes will see him, be like lightning, flashing. The nations will see him. But if you read the book of Revelation, there's going to be so much death that a very large population of the earth are going to be dead. Probably two-thirds of the earth are going to be dead. Okay, when Jesus comes. But he's going to come. He's going to slaughter the armies of Israel. He's coming to Israel to reign over the earth. And we're going to be with him. Now here's a couple other things. The two comings with completely different descriptions. I need to say some of these things and then we'll close out. In one coming, Jesus comes like a thief in the night. But in the other, all eyes will see him. One coming is in the air, but the other, he touches the Mount of Olives. And the Bible says regarding right now that when Jesus came in that 69th week of Daniel, he came to the house of Israel, but they didn't receive him. So the gospel went out to the nations over the last 2,000 years. But it says when the fullness of the Gentiles come in, that this, this age that we're living, the church age, is going to come to a close. And the way the church age is going to come to a close is the rapture of the remnant bride out. That dispensation will close. And then the focus will once again be back on Israel. And I know you guys are familiar with this. When Jesus came, that was the 69th week. And it's like if you're watching something and you push pause, 2,000 year church age, and now... We're dealing with Israel again. It's like you unpause and the prophecies regarding Israel are finished. Here's the last couple things. There's different pictures and types of this in the Bible. You remember Enoch. Enoch lived in a very wicked generation. Jesus described the last days. It would be like it was in the days of Noah and like it was in the days of Lot. Think about that. What were the days of Noah like? You know, the Nephilim that were here full of violence and evil. We can't even begin to imagine. But Enoch lived in that generation, didn't he? But Enoch walked with God. He's a picture and type of the remnant bride in these last days that though the world is going to get extremely dark and evil, there's going to be a remnant that will live pure and walk with him like Enoch did. There'll be a people of prayer. They'll know the Lord. They'll walk with him. And suddenly Enoch was just taken out. And then the wrath of God came. What about Noah? You remember Noah built the ark. The wrath of God came down on the earth of that time. This was not um, a gentle thing. It was the wrath coming down. But God was not going to treat the righteous and the wicked the same. So when the wrath of God was going to come on the earth, he told Noah, build a boat. And Noah and his family were the righteous remnant on the earth. And when the wrath of God came down, the righteous went up above it. And then when the wrath of God subsided and those days were over, they came back down again to the earth. It's a picture and type of the rapture. Y'all see that? And here's another picture and type of the rapture. So when Moses took the nation of Israel to Sinai, and God descended, you guys remember the story. I was watching this documentary the other day, and they were talking about Archaeology proving the Bible. It was really neat seeing some things. But did you know on the top of Sinai there's still burn marks? 
<laughs> anyway, God came down on Sinai, and it was like a fire up there. It was just a burning of God's presence on the top of that mountain. And the people of Israel were around the mountain, and they saw this. You guys know the story, right? I mean, it, you know, the earth trembled. There was a loud shofar blast that I'm sure was extremely loud. And the children of Israel were so scared, they said to Moses, can you go talk to him? And we'll just stay back here. You know. But here's the picture and type of the story because a lot of people need to go back and reread this story. It's pretty amazing because there were some of the elders. So Moses and Joshua and the 70 elders, Aaron and his sons, they all went up partway up the mountain and the Bible says that they ate and drank in the presence of God. They saw God. The Bible says this, and you need to read this. They saw God, and they lived, and they ate and drank. It was God confirming his covenant, which I've taught on covenant, so you guys are familiar with that. He made a covenant. That was the covenant meal. All right. So I need to say that because I want you to see this picture in type here. Israel was described as a priestly nation. The church, the true church, is described as a kingdom of priests. The 24 elders assemble around the throne in heaven, and the leaders with Moses went up into God's presence to eat and drink. You see in that? Israel was told before God shook, comes down, listen to what I'm saying, before Moses told them three days before, before God comes down, he's going to come down and it's going to be a meeting in the air. He's going to be up on this mountain. He told Israel, you make sure and purify yourselves. Wash your garments with water. You need to be ready because the Lord's coming. Does that sound familiar? In the same way in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, we're told that we need to be ready and purified and then it said the Lord will appear on the third day remember me telling you the first second third watch the Lord will appear on the third day there's a third day principle there when Israel was looking the Bible says that God came down and there was this fire in this cloud that was up in the sky and what does the Bible say about the Lord that we're going to meet him in the air and so the leaders went up in the air. It was a meeting in the air. They ascended up the mountain and met the Lord up there. The Lord came down descending from heaven, but he did not put his feet directly on the earth. So it was at Sinai, so it will be at this first coming of the Lord. Also at Sinai, when God came down, there was a loud shofar blast. Isn't it interesting when Jesus comes to catch away his remnant bride, there's going to be a shout and what? A loud shofar blast. And just like Moses and the leaders went up to meet the Lord, the true remnant bride also will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So it's a picture and type of the catching away of the remnant bride. And just the last couple things real quick. I'm just going to kind of read through these notes. But there's scoffers and those that kind of mock the teaching of the rapture. But they have to understand that the Bible's pretty clear about it. But there's different mysteries in the Bible. There's the mystery of the church, the mystery of the bride. There's, this is a mystery. And 2 Peter 3.3 3 warns us that about walking after our own lust and those that mock the coming of the Lord. So there's going to be those that mock the coming of the Lord and mock the teaching of the rapture so there's a three opportunities here there's a post a mid and a pre-trib most people don't believe in the post-trib I mean think about it you're caught up at the end just to come right back down it doesn't really make sense doesn't hold water very few people think that way anyway the mid-trib a lot of people say well what about the last trump next week I will talk about that that has to do with the Feast of Trumpets. And they think it has to do with something during the trumpet judgments. 
um, but that's not what it's talking about. The seventh trumpet is a declaration that the Lord, the kingdoms of this world bec will become the kingdoms of the Lord, and it sets in motion the, la the bowls, the last seven judgments. So it doesn't fit. And so the only thing that's left is a pre-trib, which does fit. You'll notice it's interesting in Revelation chapter 9 that the Bible is speaking about the river Euphrates and it puts the focus back in the Middle East on Israel, doesn't it? That's the focus. You notice that after the Lord said, come up here in Revelation, you do not read one time after that about the church. But it becomes conspicuously about Israel. 144,000 Jews specifically mentions the 12 tribes, doesn't it? Specifically mentions Israel. And it talks about that woman in Revelation 12 is the nation of Israel. And just a couple more things, a lot of information. But one of the arguments is not only an escape mentality, kind of a mocking, but also they say that the rapture was taught only in the 1800s by a particular woman it was popularized and some great teachers of the Bible have gone back and studied out history Perry Stone did this Chuck Missler others and have found that that's not true they have found multiple teachings they go back to the early church stating that they believe in the rapture one of them was a man named Ephraim of Nisibis in the eastern branch of the church he lived from 306 to 373 and listen to what he said he, he said for all the saints and the elect of God are gathered prior to the tribulation as to come and are taken to the Lord lest they should see the confusion that is about to overwhelm the world because of our sins so this is not something that's just a recent teaching it's something that's ancient God's people have always believed in a catching away. And I want to close with this. And I want to make this point really clear. The Bible does not teach at all, any place, once at all, that just because you pray a prayer and accept Christ, that you're automatically going to be raptured. It does not teach that. As a matter of fact, it teaches that we better be ready if you could just say some little prayer and live however you want and still be raptured why is it that Jesus keeps saying in other places keep referencing make sure your garments are pure make sure that you're ready so here's some things I'm just gonna read through it so who's gonna be ready when the Lord does this suddenly this quick catching away Number one, Luke 23, 36, those who watch and pray. Hebrews 9, 28, only those who are looking for him. There are some people that have got their focus totally on the world, don't they? But there's a remnant that are looking for him. And note the parable of the unprofitable servant in Matthew 25, 30. Note the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25. All ten were virgins, but only five were ready when he came. That's interesting. Remember that. Because it was a teaching about his coming. It wasn't five virgins and five harlots. They were all God's people. But only half of them were ready. Why are we warned that he will come at a time we do not expect? And to make sure we're ready. See, backsliders will not have the time to repent when it's a blink of an eye. You understand? This is a promise to the overcomer. This is a promise to a remnant bride that has made herself ready. This is a promise of those like Enoch that are walking with the Lord. There's three sounds that occur at the rapture. There's a shout, there's a voice of an archangel, there's a shofar, but remember, then in John 12, 29, whenever Jesus was being baptized by John and there was a voice in the heavens, this is my son whom I'm well pleased, there were some people that did not hear it. There were others that only heard thunder, but there were others that heard what was said. Not everybody is going to be ready and not everybody has ears to hear. Those that say there's no rapture or it's away, like hundreds of years away, Friend, we're close. We're close. 
it will surprise me over the next 10 years or so if we don't see it but you know who knows the time but I'm just saying it would surprise me we're very very close to the rapture and there's a there's warnings in the Bible second Peter 3 3 I've already mentioned the warning of scoffers don't listen to the people that mock the coming of the Lord and don't listen to the people that mock the rapture they don't know I love them I'm not saying this mean or critical they just don't understand but there's going to be a harpazo whether they believe it or not did y'all hear me whether they believe it or not whether they teach against it or not there's going to be a harpazo a sudden catching away it will happen there's warnings in the Bible about discerning the times remember when Jesus came the first time and Israel did not see it he rebuked them he said you can look at a fig tree and see whenever it's time for it to bear fruit you can look at the sky and discern the times but you didn't discern the time of my coming so you will be left desolate a strong rebuke for those that don't know end time prophecy and don't know the timing of the Lord's coming listen I know that we're not going to know the exact day which is 24 hour period mind you we're not going to know the exact hour which is 60 minute you understand we're not going to maybe know that exact moment but we all better know that his coming is near those that are really his you can sense it in your spirit that the coming of the Lord is drawing near you sense the urgency and many that are hearing this know what I'm talking about and you see the signs in the earth and you know this isn't like days that are just usual like the last hundred years something's up you know the coming of the Lord is drawing near we're discerning the signs there's a warning about the servants of God delaying his coming in Matthew 24 48 the Lord warned us we would he would come when it's not expected there is a warning against the lukewarm the Laodicean church you talk about feeling like a fish out of water here we are a revival church living in a lukewarm generation a warning that in the latter days there would be a falling away from the faith in great deception it's happening right now there's a warning, 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 6, about dead religion. And Galatians talks about who has bewitched you. You better be careful that you don't get caught up in some dead religion. This is a time that we need to be walking close to the Lord. In John 14, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. He says, in my Father's house are many mansions. They're already there. He didn't go to build you a mansion. It's already there. What's he going for? to prepare the marriage supper of the lamb the wedding feast so I close with this just a moment almost made it so close where is that now though? All right. Now close with this. The Bible talks about watching and praying. Matthew 25, 13, therefore keep watch. You do not know the day nor the hour. And Isaiah 52, verse 1 says, Awake, awake, Zion, and be clothed with strength. We're living in a time to be awake speaks of being a prayer warrior, being a watchman, being awake. And the Bible says, Awake, awake, be clothed with strength. How many knows that we desperately need a personal prayer life? Your personal prayer life is how you're clothed with strength. We're living in a generation that there's going to be an, a lot of wickedness and the wickedness is only going to keep increasing according to the Bible. The coming of the Lord is near. The Bible says these will be perilous times. But we need to be awake, alert, and be clothed with strength. So I'm going to recommend a couple things. Many of our generals have either, either gone home to be with the Lord or others are kind of retired from ministry, things like that. There's a generation coming up that don't know end time prophecy. They're not reading and studying the Bible, I'm just telling you. And these days will come upon them suddenly and they're not going to even know what's going on. But I encourage you, there's a couple books. Larry Lee wrote a book called Could You Not Tarry One Hour? 
Larry Lee, last name L-E-A. Could you not tarry one hour? I recommend that you read that book because this is a time where we need to have a personal prayer life. Don't try to ride other people's coattails spiritually. Don't think, well, I go to church, that's enough. No. We need to have a personal prayer life. I get alone with the Lord daily, and I know my family does as well. The second book I recommend is by Dr. Cho, C-H-O, Cho. The book is called Prayer That Brings Revival. Powerful book. And the final book is Derek Prince, Derek Prince, and it's called The Secrets of a Prayer Warrior. The Secrets of a Prayer Warrior. Those three books are powerful books on how to have a powerful, effective prayer life. And this is a time that Jesus said to watch and pray. You do not know the day nor the hour. So we need to be ready. How many can sense that something's up? There's a stirring. I mean, the signs are everywhere. We can see what's going on in the earth. I know that you see it. We're seeing even the, in America, you're seeing an increase of persecution against Christians. You're seeing, even in America, you're seeing a loss of personal freedoms. You know something's up whenever the bars can stay open and Planned Parenthood can keep murdering babies, but they're trying to shut the doors of the church. It's an antichrist spirit. Persecution is on the rise. Personal freedoms increasingly you're going to see things moving toward more and more of a globalization a one world government keep your eye on it those that know end time prophecy you're going to see more and more the nations are going to want to come together and there's going to be a one world government of aligning the nations because in the end the antichrist when he comes he will rule over 10 respective land masses but his rule will be over the nations of the earth. But it's going to be a one world government of sorts. It's going to be like the United Nations, that type of thing. There's going to be a unification under him. The militaries of the earth will kind of come together. There's going to be more and more of a move for a cashless society. More and more you're going to see where they're going to try to use different things, maybe this pandemic, whatever, to try to do away with cash. And it's a move toward the day that eventually, it'll get here eventually because the Bible says it. And I'm not saying it'll be tomorrow. I'm not saying it'll be next year. But eventually, there's going to be a mark that you're required to take on either your right hand or forehead that without that mark, you will not be able to buy or sell. And the Bible says that. That's not something that churches are saying. That's something the Bible says will happen. And that will be the false prophet that actually institutes that, believe it or not. It's the beast that comes out of the earth, the false prophet. But it's going to be a forced thing. And you're seeing it move that way. You're seeing a loss of personal freedoms. That you better do this or there's consequences. And what will eventually happen, eventually, is that the currency of the world will become more of a one world currency. So whether it's all called one thing, I don't know, or if we're still going to kind of have our respective names for it, we still call it the dollar, it's still called in Britain the pound, etc. It may still be called that, but there's going to be like a one world currency. And if you don't take their mark, you won't be able to buy or sell, meaning you won't be able to buy groceries. You won't be able to buy gas. It's going to be a forced thing eventually, one of these days. And the world is moving that way. How many knows 100 years ago it looks a lot different today than it did then? I mean, things have rapidly moved. With technology like it is, it's no longer far-fetched that the, the nations of the world could come together like that. It's no longer far-fetched that that the currencies of the world could come together. It's no longer far-fetched when Jesus said, unless those days were cut short, no flesh would survive when you have nuclear weapons now, you see. And so this is the time 
that we need to, to look at what the Bible says. The Bible says to the remnant bride, not everybody that goes to church, not everybody out there, but he says to my remnant bride, he said, you're not appointed to wrath. The harpazo, I want to snatch you out of danger before it comes. I want you with me. He's going to come in the air. There's going to be this suddenly we're caught up with him. And then you're going to see that Antichrist really emerge. Who knows? We might get a glimpse of him before we go. I don't know. But he won't be able to really come to full power until that remnant bride is removed. Let me tell you something. The Bible talks about till the restrainer is removed. Listen, I don't think you and I can even begin to imagine how powerful the church really is in the earth. Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against us. You understand, around the world, there's a remnant group of people that are prayer warriors that have spiritual authority in God. And we pray over our nations. We're praying, and let me tell you something, because we have an invested authority from Christ himself, and we're praying, and we're anointed, and, and we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, there's something about that spiritual authority in the earth that restrains the devil's kingdom. He can't just do whatever he wants to do, but eventually that remnant bride is going to be gone, the restraining will be gone, and then you're going to see the false prophet emerge and you're going to see the Antichrist begin to come. And um, I feel the interest in this, so let me say a few more things. But the false prophet will come first. And he's going to be a real powerful person in the occult and witchcraft. But here's the thing that's so deceptive about him. The Bible says that he's going to speak. He's going to look like the lamb. Who's the lamb of God? He's going to look like the lamb, but yet he's going to speak like the dragon. That's the false prophet. Let me say that again. He's going to look like the lamb. This is Revelation 13, but he's going to speak like the dragon. And he's going to have such a, a, a satanic power about him. In Thessalonians, Paul said, all kind, excuse me, all kinds of lying signs and wonders. In 2 Thessalonians 2, he talked about all kinds of lying signs and wonders will, will accompany the emerging of the Antichrist. See, the false prophet's going to have some kind of ability about him with the devil. Now, Revelation 13 says he's even going to be able to call down fire from heaven in full view of men. Meaning like holding up some kind of like maybe a satanic staff or something and literally like at his command, lightning striking the earth in full view of people, that type of thing. And because of that, the nations of the earth will be deceived by this guy. And what's the false prophet going to do? He's a spiritual figure that's going to have a lot to do with the religions of the world kind of coming together and finding common ground, which, by the way, that's been going on for a long time now. Did y'all know that? Roman Catholicism has been doing that going back since the 80s. That's been going on for a long time. The unification of religions, even in Christianity, or uh, I would say false Christianity, but even among, amongst that, there's this weird Chrislam trying to bring Christianity and Islam together. You see what I'm saying? There's been a satanic move. You know what that is? That's that false prophet spirit already at work in the earth to bring the religions together. But once he's able to do that, what divides humanity probably more than anything else? Religion. Once the false prophet is able to find common ground and kind of bring them all together, then he's going to point to this political figure, the Antichrist. He will emerge on the scene and the nations of the earth will love him. He'll be charismatic. He'll be probably very good looking. He's, he's brilliant. And through diplomacy, he's going to bring the nations together. And he's going to sign a peace treaty with Israel for seven years. But during that seven years, halfway through it, he'll break it. And he'll go. And so the first three and a half years, you got to understand, the remnant bride is gone. But there's still going to be a lot of people down here on the earth that were playing games. How many of you got, we need to be praying because, listen, there's a lot of people that call themselves Christians that are absolutely not going to be ready when the Lord comes like that to rapture a remnant bride out. They are stained with the world. They're not living for God. They're backslid. They're away from God. And when he comes, they're going to be here. You understand? 
And so the first three and a half years, it's going to be required to take a mark. Who's going to buck up against that? Who's going to be the only people on planet Earth that's not going to take that mark? Who do you think it's going to be? It's going to be the backslidden people that realize, oh my God, I missed it. And they're going to be flooding the church. You talk about revival. The real pastors are going to be gone, right? But the churches are going to be full of people repenting. It's, oh God, you know, take me too. But it's too late. They're going to be here. But those people are going to realize, they're going to come to their senses and realize, I played games, I messed around, I should have got right with God, I didn't. And they're not going to take the mark, but they're going to be killed for it most likely, or they'll go off the grid into hiding somewhere. That's the first three and a half years. The wrath of the Lamb of Jesus is going to come on the earth. You're going to see like those trumpet judgments. Then the Antichrist is going to turn on Israel. They've already turned on the church world, the, the remaining Christians that were here, that shouldn't be here. We're not appointed to wrath. They shouldn't have been there. Does that make sense? But he's now halfway through the tribulation time, he's going to turn on the nation of Israel. He's going to set himself in the temple. And let me just say this, there's got to be a temple. See, the great battle was for the nation of Israel to even exist. In 1948, they had to go to war against all odds. They become a nation in a day. But there had to be a Jerusalem. And so in 1967, they weren't even trying to take land. They're just defending themselves in the Six-Day War. Um, they come under great warfare. And against all odds, not only do they win the war, but they take Jerusalem. Why? Because prophecy. There had to be a nation of Israel. There has to be a Jerusalem capital. And there has to be a temple. That's the next battleground. See, that may be what the Antichrist signs a peace treaty about. Is for the temple to be finished in, in service. But anyway, the Antichrist, halfway through the tribulation, is going to set himself in the temple. He's going to build some big image like Nebuchadnezzar did and like Antiochus Epiphanes and he's going to require that Israel worship him and worship his image and even secular Israel these Jews know better than that and so they're going to say no we're not going to do it and so he's going to release his military against Israel and the Bible says two-thirds of them will be massacred two-thirds Hitler killed one-third. The Antichrist will kill two-thirds. And that really grieves me when I read that because every year at Yom HaShoah, we you know, talk about never again, the Jewish people. Never again, the Holocaust. Well, unfortunately, and it's very sad, it will happen again under the Antichrist. Jesus said, you didn't receive me when I came in my name, but you'll receive another when he comes in his. You know what? He's going to be a wolf in sheep's clothing and he's going to turn on them viciously. And he's going to slaughter two-thirds of them, but one-third will be supernaturally protected, maybe in that area called Petra that right now is in Jordan. And then at the end of those days, the end of those seven-year tribulation, Israel will be crying out because the nations of the earth, are, the armies, the militaries are beginning to march against Israel. And there is absolutely no hope at this point. Only a third of them have survived. And now the military forces of the earth are marching against Jerusalem. They don't have a prayer. And they begin to look up to heaven and cry out in desperation. And in that moment, the Son of Man will come. And he'll split the skies. And his feet are going to come on the Mount of Olives. And with the sword of his mouth, he'll slaughter the enemies of Israel. That's what the Bible says. And then he's going to march into Israel and he's going to have his angels go gather the Jews into him and they're going to look on him whom they've pierced and they're going to mourn and they're going to accept him and all of Israel will be saved in a day, just as Paul said. And he's going to set up his reign out of Jerusalem over the nations of the earth, separating the sheep and goat nations. That's another thing for another day. But listen, I'm not really looking so much for the rise of the Antichrist. Uh, that's important, but I'm looking for the coming of Jesus Christ. And I want to be ready when he comes, but until he gets here, I don't have some fearful escape mentality. I won't be doing everything I can do while I'm here. And then when he comes, the Bible says we're to be with him. And I want to be with him. It's a promise to the overcomer. I don't want to miss out on the marriage supper of the Lamb. I want to be there. It's a promise to those who've overcome. So Lord, we thank you for your word tonight. We bless you. And Lord, as we close this out, we just ask you to seal this in our hearts and our lives, Lord. 
We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll shut down recordings and then we're going to pray for people who want prayer tonight. Listen, we need a fresh anointing. You can just play that iPod if you want. We need the word of God, but we need a fresh anointing in our lives. Get prayer tonight. Be hungry. Receive. Let the Holy Spirit fill you.